everybody. Welcome to the show. Yeah. And uh, what right, show is this? This is uh, oh, cruising. Cruising. Oh, Don't forget to know. catch cruising on uh, Thursday nights. And there's another great show called Flick Tease Tuesdays. Get get uh, get in, have a look. Let me uh, tell you, Moose works is so we hard. We're here on Balls and All. And where are we, Wayne? We're we're here. Um, Keep we're, working. We're at Bullsbrook. Hey, he works it so hard. I didn't get a chance to change clothes from last Two week. Two weeks ago. And I stink. But that's okay because we want to give the show to you, the viewer. Yeah, uh, good man. Yeah, is that all right? A bit over the top. All right, sorry. And uh, here we are in Bullsbrook. That's you right. I forgot, didn't yeah, you? You did. <laughs> you did forget. And uh, we got a lot of uh, great stories for you. Thanks for watching. We always appreciate it. And it checks in the mail. Thanks to those <laughs> of you who got onto the web page and left some details on the forum. We'll be following those stories up too. Now, uh, action man, what's happening here today? Uh, there's a bunch of learner motorcycle drivers behind us, but uh, I think that's about it. Okay, I'd love to say that, man. I you? understood yeah. a lot of that. Yes. About fifty percent. And uh, James, what's going to happen here? Well, we're actually going to go into the uh, uh, Bullsbrook pub, I suppose. Is that what it's called? I think it's called the Checkers. The checkers. Hey, well, yeah, try to control your excitement on yeah. that, James. Oh, I'm very You're usually pretty I'm happy excited. to go in a pub. Yeah. All right, let's get the and balls, balls and all rolling. rolling. I did that really quick. Yeah. <laughs> and let's get the. Balls, balls and all rolling, rolling and swinging. And uh, let's go to a story, part two, uh, where uh, Wayne went up and had a chat with a bunch of young ladies doing a bit of martial arts. And James wanted to do that story, too. <laughs> now I'm here with uh, Alan Pond, and uh, he's the instructor here, and uh, we just want to talk to him because it's a fantastic sport. How you doing, Alan? Pretty good, thanks. Okay, then if you could tell us a little bit about how long you've been involved in this sport and what your background is. Um, I've been involved with um, boxing and martial arts for about 13, 14 years. Um, originally started out with boxing and kung fu. And over the past uh, five or six years we've been involved with the kickboxing and Muay Thai scene and gradually developed our style from a blend of, of those styles, you know. Okay, now um, just you've got quite a few people here and I noticed when we first rolled up, um, how many people do you have in this club? I've probably got about um, 30 or 40 students in training at the moment. Okay. That's from kids to, um, you know, there's guys' classes, there's girls' classes that are going on now. Um, people from six years old right through to 55, 60 years of age, you know. Okay. So it's not really any age barriers. It's, they just got to come down and uh, get involved in it. Um, what would you say to somebody that's just starting off the sport? Is there anything they can do to basically get ready for it? or? Yeah, probably a good idea just to make sure that you're physically sound. Um, and if you do have any illnesses or um, any um, any old injuries, just to let your instructor know. Um, there's a lot of people that are doing boxing or kickboxing or tie boxing, martial arts, purely for fitness and self-defence. That's fine. They can take it on at that level. If you want to take it on at a competitive level, it's a completely different ball game, you know. But there's no reason why you can't have both groups of people training together and enjoying sport because it's got plenty to offer everyone you know okay then now just talking about yourself you've been in sport involved in sport 13 14 years um when you were coming up has the training changed has techniques changed or is it basically the same what do you think i think in um in western australia the, the technique and the training methods are definitely improving um a lot of fighters are heading to to thailand and you know we've got um videos available and the information available in the magazines today everybody's learning and improving the standard of fighters here in WA has improved considerably over the last five years where our fighters can go to Melbourne or Sydney or um, any of the other states or to other countries and compete in Japan Thailand we've got people from Western Australia that are world champions now as well so I think the standard is definitely rising here and probably right across Australia as well Oh, excellent. Now, um, about yourself, could you tell us about some of the major tournaments that you participated in? Um, I just participated in the World Championships with the two girls. And I was eliminated in the, um, in the semi-finals there. And then I went down to Patea and fought on the Brute Force World Title event there against the Thai men. Um, but I've won a couple of Australian titles, Australasian title on the kickboxing scene. I fought Sam Harvey for the world title last year uh, under Muay Thai rules. Got a Commonwealth title fight coming up. Wow. Um, won a gold medal for boxing in Singapore. And you know, plenty of amateur boxing um, fights, interstate fights, state titles, silver medal Australian titles. Sort of been around a bit, you know, sort of 
haven't really achieved my dream, which is to pick up a world title, but I'm on the way, getting closer. Excellent. Now, um, and I noticed, like, and a lot of people wouldn't think that, there's a lot of, uh, you have a lot of ladies involved in this class, which is very good, especially for self-defense and, and, and the times that we're facing out here now. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got, went and got, you know, more women involved? Because there's a lot of sports like this that women would like to get involved in, but they seem to be a little bit shy about coming forward and making that first initial step. All I've done basically is I just run a separate class for the girls. There's usually more here than what are here now, but um, some of them actually trained earlier and have gone home. And um, But yeah, I just run a separate girl class for the girls because they seem to like it that way, having their own class. They don't like getting, you know, getting mixed up with the boys and... It's sort of a different sort of training and I can, I can more target things particularly towards them, teach them the self-defence moves and that before we get them in the ring and you can teach them the fighting and sparring skills. So um, I don't advertise or promote myself or anything so it's only word of mouth that people know that I'm here and, um, and yeah, most people just ring me up or rock up and see, ask if they can join in, you know. And get hooked on it. That's good. Now, I think a lot of people would like to know, after seeing this and seeing the good job that you've done, if they want to get involved with this club, um, is there a phone number they can contact you on? we got to get that plug in, you know. That plug. Yeah, you can call me. Um, it's Midland Chinese Boxing. If you miss the number, I'm in the white pages and the yellow pages. And the number is 92941769. Excellent. And uh, do you have any sponsors you'd like to thank? Um, we had some sponsors that helped us out for the um, World Amateurs. And um, there's a lot of local businesses and that, so that support us every year as well. But in regards to the World Amateurs and the girls getting the medals there, um, just thank the um, Aboriginal Advancement Council and um, the... I uh, blew it now. But uh, Ministry of Sport and Recreation, Indigenous uh, Sport Program there. They've uh, supported Jessie in her attempts to get to Thailand and a couple of local businesses being uh, Clayton Sellers, Midland Hydraulics and um, and Mr Martial Arts sort of, you know, they all chipped in and helped contribute towards the cost of us going over there and representing Australia. So that was great. Oh, uh, excellent. Now, are there any upcoming uh, events that yourself will be fighting in or some of these ladies? Yeah, um, Ronnie Parr's doing a pro boxing show on the 5th of May at the Embassy Ballroom in uh, Belmont here in Perth. That should be a great show with um, pro boxing fights and kickboxing and Muay Thai fights. I'm fighting a guy called Ty Highmarsh there. And, uh, and then on the 19th of May, Kevin Jr's putting on a show at Altone Park Recreation Centre. And I've got Mariana, Carmen, myself, Paul, young Jeremy. There's about five or six of uh, the students from Midland Chinese Boxing will be participating on that show. So it should be good, you know. Excellent. Well, we definitely want to thank you for your time, Alan, and uh, we wish you guys every success. And I believe the next time we come in here, you'll be telling us about that world title that you've won. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> I'll launch another shot. Anyone out there wants to give me a shot? I'll fight anyone from 67 to 72, 73. I don't care. Just give me a shot at the title. I'll take it off him. <laughs> Good on you. I like that guy. He gives it balls and all. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Well, guess what? We've been laughing, I guess, because they've been looking at me, and that's pretty funny anyway. But um, anyway, I'm here, and James, I know you're upset because you wanted to do this story, and I'm sitting here with six lovely ladies, and guess what, James? We're not missing you. Now, <laughs> I'm only kidding. <laughs> You'll get me back later. Now, um, if we could get some names. I know we got Jesse and Mariana here. Your name is? Carmen. Now, we heard Carmen through the grapevine that you just had a baby and you're out here training. Now, how are you able to do that? It's easy. It's easy. <laughs> oh, okay, then. So you just had the baby and got acclimated and then you went right back into it. No, I came back about after he was about five months. Okay. And just come back and took it easy and... Now I'm back into it like I was before. Oh, that's very good. Now you can kick your boyfriend around and everything will be all good. And your name is still? Justine. Okay, now Justine, um, how long have you been doing this? I came back about four weeks ago. Okay, and uh, how are you enjoying it? It's all right. Okay. No, it's great. It's great. I love it. <laughs> I can see Jesse has given us your happy look. So that's very good. And your name is? Mari. Mari. And how long have you been involved? Uh, nearly two years. Two years, and uh, um, have you fought in any competitions, or are you just doing it for fitness? Just for fitness. Okay, then, good on you. And? Jessica. 
Jessica, there's a lot of J's going on in here. Okay, now, um, Jessica, how long have you been doing it? Five months. Five months? Yeah. And so, how many men have you kicked out in the street yet? Oh, plenty. Oh, that's good. I think I better just moonwalk my way back over here. That's happening. Okay. Now, is there anything you ladies would like to say to some young ladies that might want to get involved in this, you know, might want to train under somebody great, like, let's say, uh, Alan Pond or somebody like that? You know what I mean? So is there any, anything you'd like to say to those people? Come down. Try it out. See if you like it. And? Come down. It's good. Okay. And? <laughs> you don't have to be in it for fighting or for fitness or whatever. It's just something in it for everyone. So give it a go. Yeah, I'd like to do it so I can learn how to collect debts. Now, how, why would you like to do it? <laughs> I've got no idea. <laughs> got no idea. That's very exciting. Now, and you? <laughs> um, I think it's a bit of a confidence booster. It gives you a bit more confidence and... Self, not respect, but you're just a bit more comfortable with yourself and stuff like that. So. Good on you. And I know you want to kick some butt, but other than that. Yeah, training's it's good fun, good friends, fitness. And rather than being too scared and staying at home, locking yourself inside the house, go out, get fit, kick some butt. Like that attitude. That's a that's a that's that's a balls and all attitude. Now, uh, <laughs> now if we could say on the count of three, one, two, three. After you say uh, Alan Pons, you could say balls and all. Okay. So y'all can say Alan Pond to help y'all. Come on. Alan Pond. <laughs> on nine, two, <laughs> nine, four, one, seven, six, nine. <laughs> so we can say balls it all on three. One, two, three. Oh, no. You got to love it here. James, I know you're pissed off. Get over it, baby. <laughs> See you later. Yes, uh, yeah. it's a great story, did they, Wayne? Uh, well, thanks a lot. I know it was really difficult on you t to watch me with there all those cute little women there. Uh, I suppose it is for us. I everybody. felt kind of safe and protected because they knew martial arts. <laughs> it's and also very, I didn't. It's very good to see the women are uh, getting on the show. You know, we've had a uh, we've been inundated with emails. Lately. We've been crying out for women for, uh, for, for the show for uh, all the sports and leisure events that they're having. We're starting to cover, so that's great. Yeah. And uh, what else on? is great? Well. Just, just life in general. Okay, I'll, now I'll off to Europe soon. Now you're off to Europe soon. Yeah. Now, what things do you want to do when you're in Europe? Just have a good time, mate. Does that will that involve a lot of women, or are you gonna carry yourself down to three or four a day? Or? No, it depends, mate. It depends. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I've just been told to keep it clean, which is something we haven't done in two years. No. But anyway, that's gotta, all right. You gotta start somewhere. You gotta start mate. somewhere. Now, like they say. You and me, baby, ain't nothing but gannets. That's right. So let's do it like they do on the Access Channel. Let's go. Channel 31. Where are we going now, Wayne? We're going to go to a break. No Welcome back from the break, everybody. And uh, me and Wayne and the gang sort of just ended up in a pub today. I don't know how to happen. <laughs> and uh, while we're here, we might as well speak to the owner. Tom, how you going, mate? Good, thank you, Sal. Yeah, very good. And how long have you run the show here, mate? Five years. Yeah? Five whole years. Five yeah. whole years. Yep. Do you know a bit about the history of the pub? Built in the late 1890s. Um, and Around Ned Kelly's time? Yeah, but he wasn't here, he was over east. Oh, okay, well, fair Wrong part of town. And, uh, and it's just been added on to over the years. Um, at some stage, during the Second World War, it was used as a, as a hospital, as a lot of accommodation here and stuff like that. It was a makeshift hospital in case of need be for the Second World War. Wow, a lot of history. Yeah, it is, yeah. And then uh, it's just as it is now, we've just sort of done a bit of work through it over the years. We've remodelled it a lot. We pulled a couple of old um, houses to bits up in the wheat belt and relocated a lot of it inside here, just um, got all the old timber out of it and, and uh, there's a local craftsman who lives up in the hills there in a tree or under a tree. He, um, that's where we usually find James on a Saturday but that's another story. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and he, he did a lot of the, uh, lot of the timber work and, and stuff that you see here. What was the idea with um, obviously getting all the tea work? Because it looks fantastic. I've yeah. never really seen much of this stuff before. Mm -hmm. um, you just thought something different? Yeah, it just evolved. We just did it slowly as we went along. Mm -hmm. Just bits and pieces. Did sort of did one area and then move into another area and just walk away and come back with another idea and do something else. You can almost feel the history like when you step in yeah. here because of like all the mosaics and whatnot. Like for example, that saw up there. I mean, how old would that be? 
Uh, good question. Probably um, that'd be 80 years old, I suppose. That'd be you know turn of the century stuff. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, a lot of history in here. I mean, for a um, place like this to get going, it's, it's near a main road. When it first started, was it always near a? This yeah, this was a. Uh, well, this is obviously the main route for, for the to, up north. Um, it was a, a a major. No, I lost it. Well, that's all major right. Major drag. Major drag, like yeah. it's just a major. Yep. Oh, okay. Now um, we'll, we'll catch up with you a little later on, Tom, and yep. uh, ask you some more questions. But Wayne, uh, the story with uh, Danny yes. Green. Yes, we did a story with Danny Green, Olympic boxer, um, and he's done a fantastic job. He's now turned pro. He's at the Jeff Finnick camp at, as we speak, uh, getting ready for his first professional fight. And uh, we'll keep you posted on that. Now we had some footage. We have a lot of footage, but we had some footage of him with what he did with the Olympics, but because of SOCOG and the IOC and what have you, unfortunately we're not allowed to uh, show it. But we'll show you some of the footage that we've taken over this time and uh, should be great footage. Yeah. So have a look. Hello, uh, it gives me great, great pleasure to uh, do this interview with uh, uh, a definitely a superstar in the sport and is coming along very well, Danny Green, who is also the first West Australians to ever win a uh, boxing match for um, WA. Uh, how you doing, Danny? Good, thanks, Juan. How you doing, Mike? Good to see you again. Okay, then. Now, um, if you could tell us a little bit about the Olympic experience. Uh, Wayne, it was uh, probably the best time of my life so far. It was uh, a lot of hard work, a lot of broken bones and a lot of pain and uh, a lot of sweat and a lot of uh, time spent with my trainer, Pat, and uh, it, was, it was just an unbelievable experience, Wayne. Um, the first fight I had with Brazil, he was uh, number two in the US region. Uh, Lord Lino Barros was his name. He uh, won a silver at the Pan Ams in America in 99 and he was uh, a very strong boy, very you know, tall, very big, and uh, I knew he was a big puncher. And just, I was really relaxed going to the fight. There was full house, about seven and a half thousand people at the fights, and uh, came out to a land down under the song from uh, Men at Work, and just the crowd went ballistic. And uh, everyone at ground level inside the stadium, everyone on the ground level, not in the stands, was their chest would have been doing that with the vibration for the noise. Which the noise was that great that everyone's chest would have was vibrating. Wow. People were stomping the seats, and it was just unbelievable. And uh, I had about 50 of my friends and family up in one corner of the section. They had a big banner up there. And, you know, I'd, soon the first thing I did when I jumped in the ring was, you know, give them a, a quick wave and uh, give them a wink. And it was, uh, it was awesome. Then it was down to business. And I uh, ended up uh, stopping him in the fourth round. Wow. And uh, I was very pleased. The score was 17-2. He only landed two, two or three punches on me. And so it was, uh, I, you know, hit him with some beautiful shots and, uh, you know, probably... Uh, set up a really good fight for the next one and felt very confident. Next fight I had was with uh, the Russian Alexander Lebziak, three-time Olympian. Uh, he's had 350 bouts, he's a world champion and current uh, three-time European champion, 97 world champion going into the Olympics, uh, the, probably the most, apart from Felix Savon, the Cuban heavyweight, the, uh, the most experienced and well-known fighter at the Games and uh, I knew I had him so uh, it was kind of, you know, it was, it was tough and I was looking forward to fighting him and uh, I knew that I'd kind of had a feeling I'd get him. You know, I'd draw him and, and, and get to fight him, so I was really excited. I'd, you know, I'd rather go there and fight the best than, than uh, you know, fight someone else and, you know, maybe lose or whatever, you know. Now, uh, there's been some comment that this guy was so good that he not only hadn't lost a fight in two years, he hadn't lost a round. So what was the feeling going into that? Wayne, uh, he's, he had two hands, two legs, and uh, you know he's the same same as me. I was very fit and very strong. Had an awesome preparation, um, really good sparring in New Mir and uh, in Colorado and US, and had a good tournament in Bali. I fought the uh, the um, European heavyweight champion in Bali, and he dropped down a light heavyweight and gave him a really good fight. So I was really confident going to the Olympics. And then uh, when I found out I had Lebziak, I knew I'd get Lebziak because you get the draw. So you find out who your first fight is, and then if you make it through that, you find out who you're going to fight next if this guy wins. So I knew I had Lebziak. I knew once I got through Brazil, I had Lebziak. So I was uh, really excited, and he, uh, he's an awesome fighter. He knocked out our guy from uh, 96, Justin Crawford. He put him in hospital, actually. Wow. Crawford spent two nights in hospital because he's so badly concussed, you know. So uh, I was looking forward to getting in there and giving him a, uh, giving him a bit of mine for, for my good mate Justin Crawford, who, uh, who uh, you know, said to me before the fight, he said, go on, Greeny, give him a bit. So uh, it was good. <laughs> okay. But, uh, yeah, he, uh, I started off really good, but I broke my hand in the first round. First, first 55 seconds on the tape, you can see it. I landed a flush right hand and uh, really rocked him with a punch. And uh, I knew straight away, bang, I broke my hand because I've broken this one three times. I just got on with the fight and then I uh, was actually leading 3-2 going after. After the first round, I was ahead 3-2.
Now, a lot of people didn't know that. I think they probably saw the fight and didn't see what happened. But, I mean, for you to keep going after getting your um, hand broke in the first round, that would have took a lot of guts. Well, it's, I wouldn't even think about it, Wayne. I mean, I've, I've done it. I've actually done it. It's the fourth time I've fought with a broken hand. So it's, wow. not, really a, it's not really a problem. In the Olympic Games, mate, I would have to be uh, unconscious to <laughs> stop fighting, basically. And uh, so nothing was going to stop me, and I was going really well, and I was hitting him with some really good shots. Before the fight, my aim was to, you know, I had nothing to lose. I was fighting the best fighter there, so I thought I'm just going to go out and throw bombs at him and, and uh, you know, have a real dig, and had an awesome fight with him. And uh, second round, coming out in the first 10 seconds, bang, left hook and dropped him. And uh, the crowd just went into overdrive, and <laughs> my heart was pumping, and then, uh, yeah, he got up, and then uh, after that I landed another really, really good right hand. And that was what really damaged the hand because because uh, I didn't have my hand closed properly, it was open so uh, the hand cracked back really badly and I chipped a few bones in the scaphoid lunate region as well as the fracture plus damaged my tendon and my ligaments really badly. Wow. And uh, as I've done it, you can see in the video, I've just put my hand between my legs and I'm just cringing and the referees, I'm jumping around like a kangaroo, I'm just going, oh. <laughs> and the, the referee was, uh, you know, he was looking at me kind of strange and, uh, you know, and we went on with the fight. Anyway, um, that was, a, that was probably the, the best punch of the fight that landed and uh, just unfortunate. And I actually thought, because all the pain went up through my arm, that was the ligament and the tendon, I thought it actually stabbed the bone into the flesh, the metacarpal into the flesh, but it was, I didn't know that until after the fight, you know, I got, my, got the glove off, I didn't realise I hadn't done that, because that's what it felt like. But then after that I only had one hand, one. It, was, it was tough, even blocking punches. Um, I could only throw left hooks, jabs, I hit him with a few right hands, but as soon as I hit him, bang, it was like, ooh. So I had to uh, compensate by throwing a few headbutts, and uh, I got a warning. I got a point, two points given against me for headbutting, um, but uh, you know that was that was part of the fight. He was dirty as well, and uh, in the end of the story, I'm a very fair fighter, and uh, you know I'm, uh, I've had some some really good knockouts. And you know if, if I've seen someone's not as as competitive, he's not as good as me, and I can knock them out, I'll you know I'll knock them out. But you know I won't try and hurt him too much. But uh, it's a fight at the end of the day, he's trying to knock me out, so I want to do anything I can, yeah. any advantage you can take. So I threw a few headbutts in and uh, <laughs> got, a, got away with a few, but then it got picked up. But uh, ended up having a really, really good fight. And um, it was, as you said, no one really knew they had a broken hand, which was kind of frustrating. You know, it, was, uh, it looked like I was uh, not fighting to the best of my capabilities, although I gave him the best fight that he's had in a long time. I don't, I don't know whether he's ever been dropped, so I'm not sure, so I dropped him. And... Uh, he's, uh, the, the, the seat of his pants got a bit dirty from the, from the uh, canvas. <laughs> Which was <laughs> these things happen when you're getting hit with that type of uh, power. Now, um, um, after the fight, was there a bit of a controversy there, or what happened in that situation? No, nah, there's there's no controversy. Actually, the controversy was before the fight. So we had a bit of controversy with the Australian team. Okay. There was a bit of problems going on. A few of the boys when we were away weren't uh, doing what they should have been. So there was a bit of problem there. The news hooked onto that, and they really blew it out of proportion. Um, so there wasn't really a problem there. It was now, isn't that amazing, though, Danny? You guys worked your guts out and done the right thing by everyone. And the only thing that, unfortunately, the media chose to pick up on was the fact that uh, maybe a few people were a bit out of line. I mean, you guys really worked hard for this all this time. And I think maybe they should have focused on the good, positive things that you guys have done getting ready for this. Yeah, that's right. When we, uh, you know, I've slaved my guts out for a good six years to make it to the Olympic Games. Nothing will ever take away the experience I had, um, you know, like walking into the stadium, walking out a winner against Brazil was just, you know, it was just unbelievable, mate. And then uh, walking in with the Russian and actually uh, giving him the best fight he had at the Games. I mean, he went on to, to knock out his next few opponents and won the gold medal absolutely base. He, he didn't even get pushed after that. He was, you know, just cruised. So, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was tough not getting the, the uh, exposure from actually having such good fights instead of being concentrated, you know, the, the media kind of concentrating on a bit of a scandal. So, yeah, it was, they should have really concentrated on what we're, the good things we're doing and, uh, and not worry about the other crap. Now, um, preparation for a fight. I think there's a lot of budding young fighters out of there. I know um, Tony, one of the guys that works with us, always tries to fight me every single time. So, um, basically, for someone just starting to learn this, um, what was your preparation like, you know, getting ready for um, a fight? Like, what do you go through? What is your ritual? Uh, I'm pretty relaxed, Wayne. Like I'm basically like I am now. I'm not. I don't get hyped up. You see, a lot of guys get all crazy and hyped up, and they want to, you know, they want to smash the brick wall down, and they hit the wall, and they start hitting the lockers, and it's like, well, what's the point? You know, I'm going to save my energy so I can hit you with my energy, not the brick wall. And they get a bit 
a bit crazy, you know. Mm. And then when I'm fighting, I like to, to uh, try and provoke them a bit, you know. I like to give them a headbutt or say something in close or throw a little elbow just to get them angry. And then they start swinging and it opens up openings for me. So when they start getting angry and swinging, it makes it easy for me. But usually I just, I just cruise, mate. I'm stay, you know, stay focused and think about what I've got to do. But at the same time, I'm joking. I'm just laughing. got music playing. And uh, just, just stay as relaxed as possible. So, uh, you know, my heart beats just like that. Okay, now, um, uh, what type of music do you have playing? I know you have probably have Wayne Simmons solo grooving, but what other type of music do you have playing? Apart from, uh, yeah, solo grooving that I, I, uh, I've actually never heard of. Okay. Um, no, only joking, Wayne. I saw it on Channel 31. It was, uh, it uh, inspired me not to take up singing. But, uh, <laughs> no, only joking, Wayne. It was, uh, it was an awesome song, mate, and I've actually got it in a tape player at the moment. That's what I got pumped on to come down here with. But, uh, apart from solo grooving, mate, uh, I usually any, anything that's going to get me uh, get my heart going, just you know, Chemical Brothers or uh, old Akadaka or you know, anything. A um, bit of George Benson or a bit of Harry Belafonte usually gets me pumped. I mean, I'm sure you probably heard the uh, Jared Junction commercial uh, that Moose sang on that you know try to keep you pumping as well, right? That's another great CD that I've actually going to haven't purchased yet, but Pat and myself are out to get it, so yeah. Yeah, okay. look, that's that's, that's brilliant. Now, um, also too, now um, a lot of young people that are want to get involved in this or um, maybe want to see you in action. What's up for you now? Uh, how's the hand? I think a lot of people want to know. And when is your next fight? I'm actually turning professional now, Wayne. Uh, I'm going to train with uh, Jeff Fennick over in Sydney. And uh, joining Team Fennec, there's a whole stable of fighters there who, uh, you know, some of them are ranked in the top two in the world. There's about three guys ranked top two, three in the world. So um, I'm also going to have to relocate to live in Sydney. Um, and I've got my first pro fight, April 20. It's at the La Montage in Sydney. It'll be on Foxtel on a Friday night. Uh, coverage starts at 5.30 p.m. Western Standard Time. Starts at 7.30 over in uh, Sydney. So you'll be able to watch it on Fox. Um, and then from there, hopefully, Jeff's, you know, we're looking at, uh, he's my promoter and trainer. I've got another group that are uh, looking after my managerial aspects, uh, Sports Group Australia. Um, Ralph McManus and a couple of guys down there are looking after me, and, and they're uh, looking, f looking after my, uh, my taxes, my accounting side of things. Um, they look at contracts and all the lawyers, they, they go over it, and if there's any, uh, any dodgy sides to it, they can say, look, Dan, this is not too good or this is good, you know, we want to go for it. They look after sponsorship and uh, endorsements and stuff like that. And, um, and Jeff's my promoter and trainer, so he's going to get me the fights. And uh, we're looking at four or five fights, hopefully we have the Australian title. The current Australian champion's Anthony Mundine, super middleweight, 76-5, that's what I'm fighting in. I've come down actually from 81 from the Olympics. And because uh, you have a 24 hour weigh in professional boxing, you can weigh in the day before. So you've got a whole, you got, you know, you've got a whole 24 hours to rehydrate, whereas amateur boxing, you weigh in the night of the fight. So you've got to hold that weight. Then if you win your next fight, you go on and fight the next night. A lot of tournaments when I've been overseas, I've had to fight three nights in a row. Wow. So your body really gets run down, so it's pretty tough. So uh, professional boxing, you get a whole day to weigh in. And then you get to rehydrate, pig out, back up another four kilo, four and a half kilo maybe, to, to, your, to your natural weight where you sit on. And uh, yeah, so we're looking at the Australian title in between four and six fights. And then looking at going overseas, Jeff's got contacts in uh, England, America, South America. Um, South Africa, so there's, there's a lot of opportunities to fight overseas as well. So, really excited, and uh, you know, just first year, just take uh, take it take it uh, you know slowly, slowly, and keep learning in the gym and, and every fight I have, and hope they have a few good early knockouts, and then uh, just uh, after the first year, take it from there. Okay, then, well, look, we want to wish you every success. I mean, you've been a fantastic ambassador for the sport of boxing, especially WA, bred and born. Uh, I'm sure you're going to keep looking after the guys back home. Maybe say hello when you knock a guy out. You can say, how y'all doing, balls and all. And uh, <laughs> is there anybody you'd like to thank? Any sponsors, what have you, friends? Yeah, definitely, Wayne. Uh, thank you very much to uh, my family, uh, my friends, my girlfriend, Nina, um, and you know, like all the people that have helped me out, my coach Pat, who I've been with since 1991, and uh, Pat's like my second dad, and uh, we we uh, we get on very well. And uh, sometimes, if uh, I clip him, he doesn't clip me back, which is good because he uh, he's uh, he's getting on Pat, but he's still got a demon punch, so I don't want to get hit by it. But he always gets through occasionally. But uh, no, I'd like to thank uh, you know my friends and my family, and uh, also like to thank um, the West Australian public and the boxing public in general for supporting me. 
Um, but my main sponsors are the guys I'd like to thank. I'd like to thank they're the ones that I couldn't do it without. Uh, the guys that be looking after me, that have looked after me in the past, and are going to be sponsoring me in the future. Uh, Russell Athletic uh, Clothing Company have been around since 1902, and they've uh, they've helped me out for f been there for nearly five years now, and they've been awesome. Um, Asics Shoe Company give me free boots, free shoes, and uh, look after me very well. And uh, also uh, Rockingham Hydroblasting, a guy called Alvin down in Rockingham. He does hydroblasting. They get rid of graffiti and they do spray uh, spray off the graffiti and all the dirt and uh, concrete and stuff like that. And uh, they sponsor me and looking after me. So so uh, very happy with those blokes and uh, that's about it mate, just uh, looking forward to getting over there and uh, winning the Australian title. And uh, one more guy I'd like to thank uh, Wayne is uh, a man called Mick Pemba, he's a good friend of mine and uh, he's really helped me out um, getting me sponsorship and uh, he's been terrific to me and he's continued to help me out now and uh, i just like to thank you very much Mick. Well um, you've been a fantastic ambassador for the sport so we want you to go over there and knock him out. No worries, cheers Wayne. Thanks very much to Balls and All too, guys. Do a great job. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Moose from Balls and All. I reckon you should watch Balls and All every Monday night at 8.30. No, 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 no. I'm Wayne from Balls and All. I reckon you should watch Balls and All Saturday at 4 p.m. No, no, Monday. They no, 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 Saturday. No, don't push me. Hey, hey, I, I said, said Saturday. 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 What are you doing? Saturday. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Moose from Balls and All, your sports and leisure show, and I say watch Balls and All every Monday night at 8.30. Hey, if you don't get hit with the mic, listen to this. I'm Wayne from Balls and All. I say you should watch it Saturday at 4 p.m. No, we'll do it again. All right. After training, uh, thanks to Lou Decker down at uh, Decker Magnetics Impulse Supplies over in Vic Park. Um, this system runs magnetic impulses through the legs, through the quads, the groin, and the hamstrings. Also, the system that goes over my hands, I plug it into a battery, a magnetic impulse is then activated through the legs, through the pants, through the knuckles, through my hand, and also uh, any other body part I wish to put it on, which increases blood flow. The veins are opened up, blood flows through the veins quicker, so it more openly, which uh, increases oxygen to the part of the body which you want to recover quickly, which helps in healing. And also supplying uh, bed pads, which help you sleep at night, which increases blood flow, which in, uh, in turn increases your healing process much quicker. All right, now we want to thank everybody from uh, Danny Green's camp and all the people that were involved in that story and um, we are going to keep you posted on that if there's any more details to give you on that. Now what else is happening now that we're in Tom's den of iniquity? Well that's right we're still here with Tom and uh, we're going to go to a break and we'll catch up with him just after this message. Everybody and uh, Tom, where are we? We're uh, about 20 minutes north of Midland on the Great Northern Highway. Um, it's about an hour out of the city, I suppose. Okay. Now, um, um, being an hour out of the city, I mean, you're right next to Pierce Air Base, uh, what are some of the things that go on here, at Checkers? Yeah. Well, in the area, it's the immediate area. Um, we've got the Air Force Base. It's Chittering Valley. We're right on the edge of Chittering Valley, so there's a there's a nice a tourist drive, 30 odd k's of tourist drive. They've got a lot of people up on weekends, um, just just doing the doing the valley, motorcycle uh, groups and stuff like that. A lot of people rock up for lunch. Um, Sundays we do a, you know we, we do meals all day. Saturdays, Sundays. It's so pretty um, busy on those two days. Yeah, we get a lot of people just just tourists and yeah. stuff like that. Sunday That's nights good. we do a, a spit. We do a spit roast. Um, yeah. We do beef and pork and all the veggies and stuff like that. Now family. Most sing Sunday night. Oh, yeah, so there's a bit goes on. Do you ever get like a band in or anything? Do a bit of entertainment now and again, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, Moose has got a CD out and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, Jared, Jared, Jared Junction. <laughs> you know, so uh, maybe you can get him up here and do a couple of tunes. That's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great idea. <laughs> but um, yeah, what um, like uh, other nights and stuff, what other kind of events people might want to know and come and have a look at? Just, uh, yeah, we just, we just do a lot of. Um, uh, just a lot of emphasis on, on meals yeah. and stuff like that mm, up here. Yeah. Um, Eating is important with us yeah. too. It is, yeah, and drinking, yeah. Yeah. obviously. Yeah, well, there's nothing <laughs> right. yeah. This table is fantastic. Was this, uh, it's obviously you said you've been running it for five years and you've uh, been remodelling it. Mm -hmm. um, just this is one of the Who things. built this? This is magnificent. The, the chainsaw guy, same guy? The chainsaw guy, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Lo buddy. A local <laughs> fella, uh, yeah. craftsman, Johnny Allen his name is. Yeah. He's up in the, up in the bush. Fantastic. Um, it's all local. 
wood. This this is all, all Jarrah, the Jarrah top. So this is all one do. This is all bush timber from out the back. So it's all local stuff. Just been uh, just done it as we've gone along, mm -hmm. bit by bit. And how are you enjoying running it here? Good. Yeah. It's a good location. It's far enough out of town and sort of know who's who and who's not. I mean, it's very relaxing just being out here. You know, it's uh, it seems to be very relaxing too as well. So if people want to get away and don't have to go far, yeah. you can come out here, huh? Yeah, maybe a lot of that a lot of day trip has come out. Yeah. Yeah. No worries, mate. Thanks a lot for your time. And uh, we're going to send to a story Moose did recently at Dwelling Up for Survival, so check it out. Hi everybody, it's Moose here, and uh, at the moment we're in a place just out of Dwelling Up. As you'll remember a while back we did a uh, show here uh, on Balls and All, and I'm just out of uh, Dwelling Up, and we're at a place called Icy Creek. And it's uh, kind of a warm day. I don't know about the Icy Creek. We're going to find out about that. But I'm here with Bush Perceptions, and uh, we're going to be walking around and learning a few things about bush survival. So I hope you find it interesting. You can see uh, uh, they're setting up the tent. We're going to have a bit of morning tea. Nothing wrong with that in the bush, is there? And uh, there's Des here running around, uh, busy trying to set up the, uh, the, the whole uh, tent area there. And uh, off in the background, we've got uh, the rest of the crew. So we're going to catch up with them, and we're going to be covering a few things, just some basic things for now, uh, that may be helpful to you if you do happen to do a little bit of bushwalking or something like that. And I uh, hope you find it interesting. Yeah, well, here we are now. We've walked uh, just a little ways into the bush, and I'm with some of the gang here. And I'll introduce them to you, because you're going to be seeing them throughout these uh, segments. And hello, Jane. How are you? Good, thanks, Moose. Now, you're actually with the Bush Perceptions. That's correct. And you're going to be guiding us. What's the first thing we're going to be all be learning? Uh, today we're actually going to learn how to find water and how to put plastic bags over trees and basically whether we use a clear plastic bag or a black plastic bag. Okay. And uh, there's no beer trees though, is there here? No, no I'm afraid uh, not. And the bourbon one's moved, so you've got to chop that one down. <laughs> okay. Which way was it? Which direction? <laughs> okay. And our driver who drove us all the way here, hello Stephanie, how are you? Good, thanks Moose. And were we good passengers? You were fabulous passengers. We won't mention we stopped at Macca's on the way. <laughs> and you're actually with the, the local caravan park, your name again? Rose, Rosemary Bryant. Rosemary, and now how long have you been, you've only been here about 12 months? In the caravan park, but we lived here about 15 years. Okay, so you're, you're some of the normal dwelling up people. <laughs> yeah, we are. Cool. We haven't got five toes, I mean ten toes on each foot either. Just... I thought it was six and you had to be Tasmanian. <laughs> no, no, ten toes on each foot they say. But her brother is the best kisser in town. Is that right? <laughs> oh, no, I hope not. <laughs> okay. And your name? Wendy. And your involvement down here? My husband and I run the Nanga Bush Camp. Okay. And what is the Nanga Bush Camp for those who don't know, like me? Nanga Bush Camps are three bunkhouses. We sleep 100 people in each bunkhouse and wow. we can cater for schools, weddings, parties, anything, anything <laughs> like that. Oh, fantastic. And, um, yeah, it's a good place. 80 acres of bush. So plenty of accommodation when you come down here. You don't have to just camp near the river, although the river is fantastic, the old Murray River, isn't it? Oh, it is. And you've never had any marin from there, have you? Definitely not. No, no, no. because marrying is illegal unless it's during the right time of the year. And your name, sir? Uh, Peter Moose, how are you? Good, mate. Now, what's your involvement with all this? My involvement is to do some training, and I'm interested in personal development. Yeah. And I wish to um, run some courses and business in that. And I can see a lot of people actually developing their own skills through this type of uh, encouragement of uh, their inner strengths. And that's why I've come to learn about it myself today. The first Fantastic. thing we're going to learn is what? Basically how to find water because we can last up to 26 days without food, without muscle deterioration, but we can die here in our outback in less than eight hours from dehydration. So, so a lot of people don't realise in eight hours, of course, is that, what about, is that different times of the year that's a, a big factor, obviously with the sun and everything? That's correct, yes, but we should drink a minimum of two litres of water every day anyway, and if we're out in the sun like we are now, then of course our water intake is going to be higher. So we need to find water. So if I basically gave these guys two litres of water today and said you're going to be here for the next three days, Hopefully they will drink all their water on day one and that would give them two days to find you know, water from an alternative source. And that's what we're going to do now is put some placky bags on trees. Find yourselves a tree. Is there any difference in the lengths of the bags? No, that's well, exactly that one is a little bit bigger, but that's, that's not a problem. Size doesn't matter. No. Yeah, I was wondering about that because uh, Wayne has just uh, gone about this about the, uh, the bag. So we've got a black bag black and a clear. 
Now, first thing, of course, is we want to find a tree that's not toxic because any toxins that come from the tree will go into the water and so it's going to taint the water. So we need to find a tree that we can use down here that is going to give us plenty of water and, of course, down through the Jarrah forest, we've got our, our Jarrah trees. They also need to look at where the sun's going. So we need to get the maximum usage out of the sun so we don't want to find a branch that's got the sun now but as the sun comes across the sky okay. we'll be in the shade so we need to utilize the sun as much as possible so obviously if you're stuck watch the shadows is that a trick yeah, that's hey. it okay king, hey? now les higgins watch out <laughs> now preparation of course is 99 percent here so if they just go and put a plastic bag or what we should perhaps do is let just go for it and then we can go and show them their mistakes and yeah Everyone yeah. learns from their mistakes. Yeah, because we're so, both really knowledgeable about here. <laughs> <laughs> so guys, find yourselves a tree. <laughs> Something actually you mentioned now, uh, Les Higgins, who uh, we all love, uh, especially on balls and all, the uh, yeah. Bush Tucker man. Uh, when we spoke to him a while back, what, something he said is the reason why he actually got involved in doing what he's doing is he was always flying it with the uh, army back and forth to places like Darwin. Yes. And he just happened to say in the plane, well, what happens if a plane crash or a helicopter crash or something and we have to survive down there so I mean that's how he came about how did you get into all this I actually started doing school camps when my girls were little yeah and really enjoyed working in the or coming down the camps and then sort of working with a few guys down here in dwelling up then I was given the opportunity to attend a, an outback safety course and from that did a 50 kilometer walk in the Pilbara and then a 200 kilometre walk and then was fortunate enough <laughs> two years later to do a second one and on that one we actually only took a little soap box and um, had to carry water for 10 days in our plastic bags. Um, Is this that for the 200? Yeah, that's wow. correct and that was through the Pilbara. So and food and everything you found along the way? Um, we caught fish and we got a few bush foods. But see, this is the thing we're trying to get through to people. You don't need the food. And especially in that situation where you're walking and you're walking 20 k's a day or approximately 20 kilometres a day, the adrenaline kicks in and food is not a priority. It's water. water. Yeah. And I, I drink a lot of water as it is. So to start walking down here for two or three days, then I, my water intake sort of suddenly jumps up. You know, if you're, we have two designer faults in our body, and the first is, if um, some of us have a few more, <laughs> a few more. faults than that. <laughs> well, okay, well, we all do have two designer faults. The first is, um, the first organ in our body to be affected by dehydration is our brain. A bit like when we've had a few too many alcoholic beverages. Wouldn't know nothing about that. <laughs> neither, neither do I. <laughs> now we know why that bourbon tree's been cut down. And the second is we can sip water, which will quench our thirst, but actually doesn't stop us getting dehydrated. Um, I'll kind of get out of the way of the bag. That's all right, I'm over here. <laughs> this one here was... No, this is what we did earlier. No, this, <laughs> this is on sale of the century now. <laughs> <laughs> These guys have actually picked, um, we've got a eucalypt tree, so we've picked a non-toxic tree as we were talking about. I don't know, we weren't actually watching, but we were saying preparation is a major part in this. Now, did oh, you guys shake, yeah, shook the tree? Yeah. yeah what often, see, although I can see, no, I don't think so. Actually, let me just ask, <laughs> what, made you, what, made you, what made you shake the, the limb first? Because we wanted to annoy you. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so they did it for a reason. No, yeah. to get rid of the bugs and grave leaves that would be on the But you <laughs> thought of that without being told ahead? <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So what? Yeah. What they needed to do was to shake that branch because, as Steph said, there might be loose twigs or leaves. There might be bird poop on there. There's spiders, ants. So anything that's on those leaves will be trapped in there and actually come into the water. So it can taint the water. Um, so instead of having clear, fresh water, they've got mini strainy soup. You know. So. <laughs> and there could be koala bears for anybody in the army. The old drop bears. Yeah, the old drop bears. <laughs> Now the other thing they could have done is they've actually sealed it up here, but as you can see, look at this, we've already got um, condensation, transpiration yep. stone tape paste, already. but they could have taken a little bit of this air out and sealed it a little bit tighter up here, so it's still quite loose. So to make it a little bit more airtight... And the um, reason for getting rid of the air? Well then of course the leaves are going to transpire a little bit quicker, the water's going to um, land in the bottom. And these guys are actually now starting to check, but... Even is uh, there was nothing said that they couldn't make a gasket, so we could have used a bit of tissue or toilet paper and just sort of sealed this a bit tighter. See how it's Some quite loose Some of the other leaves, here? maybe. Yeah, we could have yeah. done that. And the more leaves they get in the bag, the more water they're going to collect. 
Now the one thing I wouldn't suggest that they do is when they start seeing water falling in here is cut the end off to have a drink because then we're stuffing you up lost our bag. bag yeah. So um, what we do is we actually change, just take the bag off, empty the water out and, and move it around. Okay, we're going to have a look here now. So these guys have actually put a black plastic bag on. Same thing, they needed to take a little bit more air out of here. Hey, this is even after they cheated. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, it's good. disgusting. I'll go with a big hug. Gave it a big hug. And They've sealed it up. <laughs> but these guys are going to find now that we're already getting into the shade. So they're going to, once the sun comes across a little bit further, this bag will actually be in the shade this afternoon. So um, I'm afraid... It'll actually suck the water back. Mm, I'm afraid, guys, the uh, water is not going to be very big oh, in this at all. Yeah, thanks very much to everyone at Bush Perceptions. And we've got quite a few more of those stories to come. So if you're interested in a bit of bush survival and uh, the ins and outs, uh, a little bit about bush, and uh, if you do plan on ever doing any traveling uh, through either the northwest or even the southwest anywhere, uh, it, they're good people to get in touch with and really good to talk to. And as I say, we've got some more uh, stories from there. Mm. Now, you've actually taught a bit of, little bit of bush survival in the cadets. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you, taught, you teach things such as how to find water, um, how to, different ways of purifying water, improvised shelters. Um, different ways of um, surviving in desert climates, in jungles and stuff like that. And it's very interesting. And um, I've been out of cadets for five years and I still remember all that sort of stuff. So it comes so in handy. The biggest thing that uh, Jane pushed there, of course, was water. Of course, she said food. Some of us can live for probably months away yep. from it. Yep, it, work, it works out that someone can live with, without food for um, three weeks. Some of us probably three months. <laughs> But they can only be without water for three days. So it's right. quite a big difference between food and water. So, Okay, well, we're going to have more of the stories. And uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to be going to a break. But before we do, I just want to point out uh, my great uncle, uh, Jack, here. And I was told that that was actually done by a airbrush. So a uh, very interesting picture freehand when you well. see it uh, freehand, when you see it up close. So uh, to all the Daniels family, a big hello. Right here from Baldwin Hall. Welcome back from the break, everybody. Uh, we're still here at the Checkers Bar. And thank you very much, Tom, on behalf of Balls and All, for you and your staff looking thanks, after us. Thanks for coming, guys. Yeah. Yep. No, we've had a great time here. And uh, if someone out there is thinking, I wouldn't mind coming down for a day and checking it out, because it is great. I mean, especially just the woodworking here is worth coming down and seeing. Yep. Is there a number someone can contact? Yeah, give us a bell on uh, 9571211. And uh, for any... One more time for the uh, television screen. 9571211. There you go. And uh, group bookings or anything like that, we take, you know, we cater for functions. We've got a... Yep group of 30 or 40 want to come out and mm -hmm. put some entertainment on for them, what have you, then yeah, give us a call. No worries, thank you very much. And we can definitely supply the entertainment. Now, uh, Wayne, uh, recently you did a story on some models, mate. Would you like to tell us a bit about oh, that? Oh, man, they were gorgeous and fat. No, it wasn't that type of models, <laughs> actually. It was uh, model airplanes. So uh, we did a story with Arthur, who was actually a World War II veteran. So uh, just check this story out. If you watch the story, watch some of the craftsmanship that have gone into some yeah, of these models. It's fantastic, isn't it? It's just unbelievable. I spent a lot of hours on them. Now I'm here speaking with Arthur Cornwall, who uh, does a lot of the restoration around here for some of the model airplanes. How you doing, Arthur? I'm doing very well, thank you. All right, then, now on a good Saturday morning, can you just tell us a little bit about some of your models, like, for example, this one? Uh, this is one I've just finished restoring. Uh, it is, in fact, uh, a Mikoyan Gurevich MiG-21, uh, a Russian jet fighter, uh, which is obsolete now, but uh, it was around not so very long ago. And um, like most of these models around here, they've needed a lot of uh, rebuilding or repainting or restoration. We had an accident actually where this cabinet fell into that one and smashed quite a few, so I've been fairly busy. Oh, okay. Then now, um, you've been doing this for two and a half years, and what got you involved in it? Well, my own flying background, um, I thought it would be nice to make models of all the airplanes I flew in World War II. And uh, that's how it started. It got me interested and um, 
friends saw me doing it and said, well, why don't you come up to the museum and uh, okay. see what you can do there? Well, let's see what we got in here as we move along. Uh, well, we've got some very special old aeroplanes here I'm very pleased with. This, these four here are pre-war RAF planes made by Hawker. That's the heart, the fury, the hind and the demon, which as a boy I used to watch okay. doing flying displays on something we used to call Empire Air Day all those years ago. Okay. And here is a very nice display of the uh, United States Navy Thunderbirds. Um, General Dynamics F-16s they are, and they call themselves the uh, fighting falcons. On this side we have some larger scale models. My f personal favorite which is the de Havilland Mosquito down there. Uh, very very beautiful aeroplane to fly. Then we have the huge uh, Hercules transport plane yeah, Hercules, that's about what it took to get me out of bed this morning, too, so I understand. So, <laughs> and something I'm very pleased with, um, which is the uh, Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. Um, these models carry the original markings of the existing Memorial Flight. And uh, I find it's a very interesting hobby. And... Uh, the museum currently has, I think at the last count, 685 models, some of them very rare, um, but unfortunately at the moment only about half of them are on display, but we're working on a new display area and I hope we're going to get them all out. Oh, that's great. Now, um, your actual flying background, you said you flew in uh, World War II. Yeah. Um, do you know how many missions you've flown? Or? Uh, well, I, not very many, uh, because I... Uh, I got transferred to uh, ferrying and I spent m many years ferrying aircraft out to the Middle and Far East. But we did a few and uh, it was the same for me as everyone else. Oh, excellent. Well, uh, we want... I'm lucky still to be here. Every day has been a, a bonus since then. That's for darn sure, and good on you. And uh, that's why we never forget our veterans here, people that fought to help make WA free. So uh, we want to thank you a lot for your time out there and wish you every success with this. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks to everyone at the uh, Model Expo there. And we've got more stories of that coming up. And the gang, I don't know where they've gone. They're here somewhere. But I want to thank you, Tom, for uh, showing us around here and all that. And uh, don't forget, if you're coming up Great Northern Highway for any reason... Make sure you come by. Yeah, we'll ah. Oh, there they are. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> okay. So, hey, so uh, yeah, thanks for watching. And uh, we'll be back next Monday night, 830. Hopefully, we'll be bringing you some stories from uh, Manjimup and uh, Margaret River. Going to do a little bit of a uh, rundown in the country, as we are now. Uh, not far from the city. I imagine what's going on behind me. And everyone, every Monday night, repeat it Saturday at 4, right here on XS31. The name of the show is... Balls and All! I'm sure you heard that. Balls and All would like to thank the following sponsors. We are looking for more people to help us in the producing of this program so we can let others know about your sports and leisure.